Welcome everyone to Thinking Outside the Blocks. My name is Ali Moss and Bess Rogers is my cohort. <laughs> um, today we have a special guest, Mike Erico, and he is a writer, a recording artist, a lecturing professor. He um, teaches songwriting at universities, including Yale, Wesleyan, the New School, NYU's Clive Davis, Institute of Recorded Music, and recently he published a book, Music, Lyrics, and Life, A Field Guide for the Advancing Songwriter, which will be given one way at the end of this class. I read and I loved. I, I think, Mike, one of the things I love about it is your sense of humor um, okay. comes through. This book is wonderful. It's It's got I feel like, you know, what you said in your intro, which I'll read, is that you wrote this book the same way you write songs. You started with a question, you followed it, and you hung on for the ride. It's safe to say that this book came from the experience of being a, a teacher and kind of the questions that come up amongst students and songwriters that you're working with. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And today we wanted to focus on one piece of that, um, this book chapter five where you talk about journaling and you, you right. call it the awesome power of daily journaling you say writing is a muscle and that journaling is going to the gym can you expand a little on that like why you think journaling is so important to songwriting yeah um well first of all thank you for having me i i, I really appreciate being here this is really uh this is really fun um uh so journaling Journaling is really where I start, I think, from the from the lyrical side of uh, of songwriting, and it, it's weird. I mean, best you're now working in a, as a, as a teacher, as a songwriting sits in such a strange universe. It's it's poetry, kind of. It's music, kind of. It's uh, so many things, kind of. And there's something invisible that actually uh, that glues them together, and there's no department for that. So like, um, I feel like I've been batted around lots of different places because no one really knows what to do with it. Um, but so what I try to do is, uh, is get people to um, commit to a thing, right? So just begin from the chaos of what songwriting is and the strange liminal place that it, that it occupies. And yet, it is the, the biggest part of music, popular music for sure. Um, but to get people to commit, right? So the first commitment is, is to um, uh, who you are and what you wanna say, right? So uh, from a musical standpoint, I ask people to take it in chunks, take it in semesters, take it in months, take it in a record, take it in some smaller piece, right? and commit to a, a playlist of sound, of songs, of whatever it is that you love, that you aspire to, and that you sort of wish to emulate that, you know, you'd be so excited to be on a playlist with, right? Uh, so, so that's the musical part of it. The journaling part of it is to begin taking the raw material of what you're doing of what you're thinking, of the cloud of bees that's sort of like buzzing around your head and <laughs> committing it to something other than being bees, right? So pushing it into some other form that is uh, accepted by others, right? Uh, an alphabet, right? English, whatever it is, um, begins the communication process. And there's lots of ways to do that. Um, and I interviewed a lot of different people because again, it's songwriting. So some people aren't lyrics first, right? Some people are not, some people just don't, if people think that journaling uh, is gonna move you into some, something else entirely. And I totally make room for that for, for students. I, I say to them, if you're journaling and all of a sudden you realize you're doing poems or scenes or screenplays or you know schematics for a you know stomp box or or a suspension bridge or something like that like absolutely go just go and goodbye you know it's been great 
this was the this was the moment you needed to find the other thing but but journaling can be predictive in that way but um as long as you're committing to something then you can find out what the heck it is you want to be committing to and and this happens in my class all the time uh it's very odd from like i mean if this semester i uh gave recommendations to someone to go to law school and i also have someone who is on America's Got Talent, who has written a parody song about Parmesan cheese, right? And he's just like, he's talking about like how you went to an Italian restaurant, they give you Parmesan cheese and you want some more, but you're kind of embarrassed and you don't want to like ask for more. That's the whole song, right? And Simon Cowell was like, that is the worst thing in the world. I can't believe it. Heidi Klum loved it, you know, and all of it came from, uh, from, from journaling and from, at committing and admitting that he's funnier than he is sensitive in songwritery, you know? Um, and the journals helped him do that. So a commitment to ideas is, that's where the journaling starts. That was the that. longest answer ever created. <laughs> really it sorry was, it about was perfect. that. No, no, there was so much good in that. I, I, um, and I love, I did see that clip of the Parmesan cheese. You did? And I, uh, yes. And I, I am a fan of um, musical co comedy of parodies and yeah. humor. And so I really appreciated that that was, you know, where he went with it and that yeah. that's an option, you know? Well, I, I do that as well. I mean, I sort of give people um, little hurdles, you know, um, and it's usually hurdles uh, that, that don't scare them, but it's the thing that they wouldn't have come up with on their own. So I'm not like saying things like, do something for two people who are, you know, who are like, you know, I don't know, who love Taylor Swift and that whatever, but like really like uh, the music industry is huge. And, and we forget, particularly at NYU, right? Uh, everyone wants to be Taylor Swift, Phoebe Bridgers. Uh, Taylor Swift actually spoke at our uh, graduation uh, this this semester. Um, those are the things. Drake, th those are the people they want to be. Um, forgetting Sesame Street, you know, forgetting Nickelodeon, forgetting Pixar, you know, or forget whatever, like all the other things, Forms, liturgical yeah. things, gospel, what, you know, whatever. Um, so parody is a really fun uh, thing. And it's, it's, it's growing. Like Bo Burnham is now, he's like one of the heaviest writers going on right now. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk about the forms and stuff, but um, oh, yeah. one of the, th one of the things you said in this chapter, you called journaling a glorious mess. And as a perfectionist, I feel like this challenged me in a good way. I think I've always had trouble journaling um, because I don't like I don't like things being messy, yeah. both practically like in my handwriting, <laughs> but also like emotionally on the page for someone to find or read or or mm. just admit to myself on the page. And I've gotten more comfortable with that mess in the in the context of like maybe a collaborative co-write. Um, but letting it sit there on the page felt very vulnerable. And as I've been challenged by this and been doing the journaling, I am finding it getting easier. And you've con you've convinced me that this is an important <laughs> piece of that oh, I of you know that I need in my writing life. Um, would you say that that's a common thing? You know, sort of oh, like amongst your students, this totally. Don't forget, I I teach um, I teach at Yale. And that is an uptight place. I just have to tell you, like, I, this is the first, the first thing I heard that I was like, I, I wish I was with someone I could just turn to and be like, can you believe this? I, I give them uh, a few different ways that we, to journal, which we can talk about. One of them is to uh, journal three pages a day and a hand goes up and the person goes, um, what dimensions should the page be? in order to get like, you know, the A or whatever, whatever it is. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Is that what you, is that where you're at? 
And I, I do talk about that in the book, but it was a Yale thing that happened. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and it has not happened since, but it was I resonate like, with that. <laughs> uh, me too. Me too. I mean, I'm an alum, so I, I get it. I mean, it, it was a weird, it was a weird moment but it was really like, wow, you really need this. And I, I recommend crayon and I recommend big sheets of construction paper for you. Um, you know, um, but at the end of the day, of course, you know what three pages is. I mean, right. you have a little one, what, it's whatever it is, right? Um, yeah. But there are lots of different ways of doing it, but um, perfectionism is uh, longhand is actually a, a move away from perfectionism. And there are people who don't do that. They, they, they work on, on keyboards. Madison Cunningham is somebody who does that. Um, she likes to type, doesn't, doesn't write in longhand. But I do think that longhand and the mess of it is actually as instructive. You can see, you can see when you are feeling decisive. You can see, literally can see when it's coming out fast, right? And you can see when you're just poking about. It's a sentence and then a doodle and another sentence and a cross out and the blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? Um, so the speed with which things are, are, are being done sits on the page and you get so much information uh, from that. Um, when, when, the, when the keyboard arrived, it was hilarious. Uh, it, uh, a lot of philosophers were like, well, this is going to destroy thought right because it's codifying the letter itself an a is an a is an a you know like nietzsche was like way not into it you know um but you know we forget we forget those things and the perfectionism that we get from all of this um i like to take a step back from it you know and and find great in the chat room right now. I find my voice sounds different between when I'm typing on computer versus writing longhand. Absolutely. The cross outs are important. The speed with which you can write uh, is, is really important. Anyway, and all of that, you're, you're committing and admitting to a lot simply through, through your, literally through your hand. I love that. Yeah, I can Be messy. Type much <laughs> be, be messy that's the that's the thing my takeaway from it was mess is okay the glorious mess I like that you call it that because yeah. um it makes it purposeful like it's okay to be messy because it has a purpose yeah um, we love that yeah I would much rather look at your handwritten diary just as a weird like a creep like being a creepy person like <laughs> that would be more interesting to me than the transcript of it that I could probably read better well it's really cool to get to see the see the evolution of your lyrics and your editing and your cross outs and yeah. your like little additions and stuff and when you're just kind of erasing you know deleting on on a word doc you you just end up seeing the fi the finished product and but I actually have the opposite thing where I am much faster typer than I am writer. And I don't write longhand very often. So my hand cramps. And so, right. so I find that my, my thoughts get out quicker when I'm typing. And I actually wonder if that is sometimes better for me to practice longhand because it's almost as if like, I have to, I have to kind of commit a little bit more and think write more in real time with my brain like <laughs> or, yeah. or slow my brain down a little bit yeah it's just interesting how i mean i i have ways that i do it and then i have ways that i suggest and then i suggest people try those ways and find the one because uh uh the people that i interviewed um have done amazing things uh with completely different uh styles uh, of doing so. Uh, one of them, I'll, I'll tell you, you <laughs> for the journaling, the thing that really shows off great work to me is not the journaling, but if the artist reads, you know, um, I think the reading reflects in the journaling tremendously. But um, so I'm thinking particularly of Madison Cunningham, uh, who is a wonderful lyricist. And she types as you do best. Uh, 
and you know taps away and she goes it's really fast she only goes for 10 minutes which is a different type of of journaling uh and then she stops and then she reads for two hours and then she gets into songwriting and i was like wow. bless you i love you more uh now because she she makes as much room for reading as she does mm -hmm. journaling and one one feeds the other yeah yeah that's super yeah. inspiring yeah she's amazing if you don't know her uh, uh I, you, you folks out there uh really worthwhile she's amazing yeah our friend daniel ryan plays bass with her really um, yeah Lucky Ugh. duck. <laughs> um, yeah. So can we talk about some of the forms that journaling would take? Like, what would you suggest to us as your students? Yeah. Stephen King's book on writing has something to, on writing. In the back of my book, there's an appendix I wrote. It's called um, Summer Reading for Some Time Later in Life. And I believe on writing is the first book uh, that I mentioned. Um, unless I did it alphabetically, but I don't, I don't actually recall right now. But anyway, the ways uh, of um, uh, the ways of, of journaling, the first one I, I use comes from uh, Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. Uh, I think that's a big, um, that's a classic. It's the <laughs> Gone with the Wind or whatever. It's the Star Wars of, uh, of journaling, uh, uh, of artist process and she came up with the three pages a day uh thing i love it because a page and a half is garbage it's what i had for dinner why my leg hurts blah blah blah, blah. and then after the page and a half things really sort of take off after you know after you've cleared out the garage you get to like fill it with something interesting um, the second one comes from Pat Patterson's Writing Better Lyrics. Uh, he's a uh, Berkeley professor, um, which is, that's a legendary book as well. Um, he has something he calls object writing, which is pick an object, any object, um, and write on it for 10 minutes, super fast. Like, go crazy. It's a sprint. If it's going to the gym, it's a sprint for the 10 minutes. The reason being that if you're in a co-write, then you can actually access ideas a little bit faster um, and people aren't like waiting around for you. And it's just a little bit more uh, attuned to a co-writing experience. So that's a 10 minute kind of thing. Um, I spoke to Eric Bazilian, who is a, um, is a writer. He's written for tons of things. We all know his music. He did uh, he wrote Joan Osborne's uh, What If God Was One of Us, right? Huge smash. He was like, you know, it's a smash when you're singing it for the Dalai Lama and he's singing along. Um, so I was like, yeah, I guess that is a smash. Um, and what he does is he goes music first, right? This is not a lyric thing, this uh, not a word thing, but a melody thing. He gets up and he calls it a uh, riff du jour. Uh, he wakes up in the morning, picks up the guitar, noodles, 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 until he finds something. And then he'll record it on his phone, uh, dates it or whatever. Um, and if it's really pulling at him, he will go forward as far forward as he can to, to finish this song. Because um, the, uh, what I did notice about journaling and about songwriters in general is it's a lot like being a firefighter. There's like a bell rings and you kind of have to go down the pole and then it's, there's time it's, it's on, you know, these things come very sort of in flashes. So, um, so he really, he really recounted that well, I thought. Um, and he just, uh, so he created, creates these riffs du jour's. He was in a band called the Hooters, which was a, a very big band uh, in the 80s and 90s, still very big in Europe. Anyway, he did a lot of that stuff was all riff du jour. Uh, he's written with Cindy Lauper and many, many others. The big hits, the big ones. And, uh, and, and so he's a riff du jour guy, wonderful guy. Um, and then there was another way, 
which I thought was really interesting. I heard it from a podcast called Song Exploder, which you guys should really check if you haven't checked it out. It's really good. There is an episode uh, by Meek Mill, the rapper. And what he said and his uh, producer said is don't journal. Don't do that stuff. <laughs> um, if you're feeling it, record it. And so his journal is literally feeling inspired and running again, firefighter esque, running to the microphone, hitting the red light, and beginning the very messy process of of journaling, literally on the page. He feels that it's more immediate. It's the first draft coming out, right? It's not the polish will come later, and the pol and instead of the eraser or the pen strike through. It is, uh, it's the edit tool. It's uh, deleting and moving and, and, and that kind of stuff. But he wants the performance that you would get from longhand. He wants the performance to be part of the final product. Therefore, the journal literally is the recording device. Pretty cool. Uh I like that. I sort of feel like sometimes I combine the riff du jour with that where I just sit, hit record on my phone and as I'm noodling, yes. I, I know that it's going to be recorded if I do something I like because I won't necessarily be able to do it again. <laughs> like, oh, yes. that was interesting. What was that? And then I can stop and listen back. Um, right. It's really nice to be able to engineer a little bit too because you get those two o'clock in the morning ideas and then you come home you you know you come into the studio the next day like oh i'm gonna do it right now and yep. it never, never gets it yeah it never yeah. gets it and it's that could be exactly the same notes and it's just not there yeah. um so yeah, having exactly. it engineered well or well enough even uh can save you a lot of a lot of heartache smart um yeah in your book you give some journal prompts um just some starting points and I love the chapter on mission songs. So there's lots of ways I think to incorporate this idea of journaling and like for, for someone like me where the melody, I feel like melody <clears throat> and chords and music comes very easily, but the, what I want to write about takes a lot more work. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to commit, to, <laughs> commit more to this. Yeah. Yeah. Process. Um, there's Anything? one other yeah. sort of thing for you. You just mentioned that you're sort of a melody first person. Um, and if you are, there are, um, David Byrne gives a really great one uh, in uh, How Music Works, his book, um, which is really good. Um, uh, also, Jeff Tweedy talks about it a little bit. He called it, but David Byrne called it emergent storytelling. And what that is, and you can hear it in his music, the way he does it. You get like a groove going or whatever, and he will blather, right? Anything that comes to mind, any, you know, uh, any craziness. And what he'll do is he'll actually follow the vowels or the, the, the direction of the, the rhythmic uh, phrasing. Um, and words will fill those spaces. And now the words have emerged literally but they are not emerging from a story. They're emerging from a, uh, a concept or an, uh, an image or a, you know, just, just some sort of like impression. Um, and that's how you get songs like making flippy floppy, I suppose, you know, and, and, and things like that, burning down the house or whatever. Um, but that may be something that, that you might want to do. You know, that's a tough one for, perfectionist too so just do it alone you know nobody yeah. watching challenge accepted <laughs> we have a question from <laughs> from Paige. she says is the journaling important because it pushes you to the next thing in the moment or is there a way to go through what you've journaled to find material after the fact and how do you not be so harsh in what is good or not when you're going back that's a lot of questions um <laughs> So is the journaling important because it pushes you to the next thing in the moment, or is there a way to go through what you do? Yes. So ways to go through it, right? There is the, oh my gosh, what did he say? It was like, there was like a, there's a, a hard boiled uh, author who was like, 
and it's gross because he's just like vomit in aisle one clean up in aisle two so the first part is the per- first part is the vomit uh and the second i didn't say that totally right but um going back through your uh journals to find things is of course critical and so you would go through perhaps if you like with um a highlighter or something like that what i do is when i come up with some genius piece which is as you can tell incredibly often no um uh i i just put a little box around it you know and so then i know and i've offset an idea or a thought or something like that um so i also stay awake to the fact that this very well might not be a song this could be you know this could be a home improvement project, to be honest, you know, like if you're really going nuts, it can be anything. Um, How do you not be so harsh? Um, That's a, that's a very difficult, I think, uh, uh, experience based kind of question. Um, You don't know what's good. You just literally don't. And, and sometimes just studying history is is the easiest way to do that finding out that like some of the biggest hits were like toss-offs right five minutes it took uh uh, the artist did not know right um one of the songs that we talk about is since you've been gone by kelly clarkson written by dr luke and max martin and like it was written for pink and pink was like this song sucks (laughs) right so like and then Max Martin and Dr. Luke are like, we're the biggest writers in the world and we just blew it. And Pink just blew it. So they gave it to Hillary Duff and she couldn't do it. And then they gave it to Kelly Clarkson and Kelly Clarkson was like, I don't hear this at all. Like, this is, this is dumb. And then Clive Davis was like, guess what, Kelly? You're singing the damn song. So it's like, if they don't know what's good, right? Um, you're free. You are free. Be free. Dare to suck. You know, there's, there's, it's very hard to do. I'm, I have logic open underneath my zoom right here and I'm killing myself over a bridge and I just can't get it. But, um, but that's what you, but that's what you do, you know? And I, I have to know that instinctively, um, it will, it'll arrive. And another person that I interviewed in the class, I, I'm sorry, in the book, my bad, uh, is George Saunders, the, the not now and now a novelist, but one of the preeminent prose writers uh, in America. And he was just like, you know what? After a while, you just know. There's a little thing, he used it like there's a, a like a little gauge And when it's, when something starts to suck, the gauge just kind of tilts a little bit and you know, and you don't deny that you saw it tip. And that means that you need to continue. But when it doesn't tip, you're like, that's my instinct. That's it. There's a lot in your book about tips for editing and the chapter on troubleshooting Um, your ideas. I loved that, like that you, you know, talk about. It makes it so easy when you look in the back of a manual and it says, is your coffee pot doing this or whatever? Like, here's how to fix it. And kind of, you did that for songs, you know, like, is your song doing this? Like, here's how to, here's some things to try. Um, So you you guys really should read this book. It's, I've read, I I mean, I read almost like every book on songwriting and I feel like this is like, a you, you say it's a field guide. I do feel like this is one to like keep on hand for just like sm- small, small bits of um, inspiration or prompts to go back to and things like that. It's really great. Andy asked about like what your daily practice looks like. Would you mind sharing that? Yeah. Um, well, uh, my, um, I do a lot of, uh, of teaching, um, I'm also a dad. So there is, there is all of that. And I'm also an insomniac, which is nice. Um, so I will wake up before everybody as I did this morning. Um, I have a notebook and a pen by a chair and there's a guitar and 
I have pre-programmed my coffee pot. I, this is the most important part. Uh, so I get up uh, and uh, just I pour myself a cup of coffee and, um, uh, and I try to free associate. What that also means is that in that morning, I need to be, I need to have prioritized the journaling the night before, right? So like things like drinking, things like staying out super late, um, don't coincide with the journaling process for me, right? Because I'm a morning journaler. Um, and that's something that I, I have to tell college students, if you can imagine, go to bed early. Like if you're a morning journaler, just prioritize it, whatever it is. So I'll do the three day, uh, I'm sorry, the three page uh, thing. And I let it be whatever it's going to be. Um, a lot of times it's the, the reading I did the night before. And I'm reading a really interesting book called Bittersweet by Susan Cain, which started with her uh, exploration into why she loves sad songs so much, right? What is it that connects? Why does everyone go to a Phoebe Bridgers concert to get bummed out together, right? Like, you would think that's a separating kind of moment, but it's really a bonding moment. And that sadness and that longing is actually a very bonding thing. So she actually works through that whole thing. So that's what I've been thinking about. Um, and so that's what I, uh, that's what I journaled about. Three pages, that's, that's it. Two cups of coffee, kids wake up, game over. <laughs> I like it's like sort of like when you want to exercise, you set your, you know, they tell you to put your clothes or your shoes totally. out. And it's like you're just setting up your space yep. so that you don't have to think or decide about it. It's just like what you're going to do. Yep. At the top of the hour, you mentioned committing to a playlist. What does that look like in practice? It literally is that it's a playlist, 10 to 15 songs, because I think that in those songs that you love, deeply, deeply love are clues. There are harmonic clues and there are lyrical cue, uh, clues, um, and there are uh, there are ideas that you can uh, that you can work with. I like to say, I mean, I don't like to say steel, like great artist steel or whatever. It's literally that we're standing on shoulders, on shoulders, on shoulders, on shoulders, on shoulders. You know, and and this is a baton that is passed uh, through through us. So if I have like. Moon Shaped Pool by Radiohead is just a beautiful album. Uh, if I put that stuff in there and I, I absolutely rip off a chord change or whatever, um, well, that, that, was, that was part of a progression, a long progression. And Johnny Greenwood would be the first person to admit that, you know? Um, so uh, that's what a playlist would, would look like. Also, it's kind of nice to have a playlist of songs you love, you know, so it's, it's kind of a nice, it's, it's a nice thing. Um, and I do think it's also an admission because sometimes really weird stuff goes on, especially when you start getting on in years, you know, and your CD collection begins to become incredibly obscure as the bands like <laughs> begin to fall off the face of the earth, but you still love that stuff. It's still embedded in you. You know, when I've done that, I see patterns in just like the types of songs, so, you know, you, you can assess and notice a theme. Sure. Do they all open with the chorus? Are they all a certain BPM? Are they all doing, you know, are they all first person? Are they all directed? Are they all funny? You know, like it's there's there's a there's a lot of that. Wonderful. What do you think of object writing? There's a question that's up there. May I grab those or? or yes, yes, uh, please okay. do. Yeah, so these what, are for what, you. I love object writing. I think it's, I think it's really cool. I re also really love books that take one tiny thing and blow it out. Like Rebecca Solnit had a great book uh, recent called uh, Orwell's Roses, which is um, that George Orwell uh, planted some roses while, you know, talking about 1984 and the end of the, of the planet or whatever, uh, dictatorship and et cetera. Um, he was also doing something aesthetically beautiful and hopeful. 
into the future. He was planting uh, the, a future. That was it. So, so Rebecca decided to sort of find the rose bushes, which were out in this uh, English countryside, and found them. Some were cut, and some some weren't, but like some were alive. Um, and a whole book was created from that. So that's what object writing basically is. That was a rose bush, right? Um, I love books like Coffee. There was one called Salt. There's one called Milk. There was one called Longitude. Like I love books like that, um, where you're like Longitude. What could you possibly say? You know, and it, you know, 300 pages later, you're like, wow. You know, it's it's a huge uh, things just open up as you as you start digging into them. I'm curious earlier before we started you were you were saying talking about how you started writing your book and you said you had to write this book and so I'm I would love yeah. to know how this book came about. Okay. Well backwards, right? That's that's at the end of the day backwards. And I do talk about this in the first uh chapter that I was literally born backwards and everything ha- moves from that. So I always had a uh, real self-esteem problem that no one would ever want to hear anything I had to do. Um, So I didn't want it to be just a side man. I figured, yeah, I'll be a side man. You know, I'll I'll play the guitar. I don't, I don't know. I didn't go to like guitar school or anything, but like uh, uh, I was a side man for, for a lot of, uh, a lot of different people in a lot of different years. Um, uh, My dad is a, classical pianist and a doctor but but he took a course like a pop music course and he was like this sucks this I he thought it was like Schoenberg and 12 tone like that was modern for him and and he was like we have the same name and he said why don't you just uh take the course I you know because I don't want to ask for the money back but I don't want to lose the money so that was my first music course which get complete and and like three years later I had my first deal um then I was touring and someone asked me to speak at a college and I said no that's I don't know how to do that I mean I have nothing to tell you and he booked me anyway and I loved it and then I got teaching gigs which was weird and then I took them and then I was like you know what I don't have anything to teach I don't have I don't have a book I can't find a book there was writing better lyrics and that's it and um YouTube has everything right there is nothing you can't find so I was like well I don't want to I don't want YouTube to be my syllabus so I want to be able to do something that actually moves outside of that into the uh into more interesting places, you know? So I wanna be able to talk to John Curran, the the painter about about square canvases or uh, an astronomer, Jan 11, about repetition. Why do we repeat? Um, Things like that, that you're not gonna really find on on YouTube. Um, But it was, it was, the, the book came because the class came. The class came because I toured the touring came because my dad didn't like a songwriting class. Um, I, I really don't know why I'm even in music to be, to be completely honest. <laughs> it's, it's a series of accidents. It's a kiss of cosmic pool balls, as they say. Love it. Well, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. Glad you came out backwards and ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> my mom loves that I bring that up. Uh, <laughs> So uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's a it's a weird. It's been it's but it's been great. It's it's the best thing. I can't believe it. I I I can't believe that like I never turned around. I feel like I finally turned around. Like the the book actually. I think I'm actually walking forward now for the first time. Yeah. Uh, who are the mentors that you look up to? Um. There are a couple of teachers that I work with at the Clive Davis Institute. Um, one of one of them is Bob Power. Uh, Bob Power is the he produced D'Angelo, Erica Badu, um, Tribe Called Quest, a um, hundred thousand things. Like it's just ridiculous what 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 he's what he's done. He's a very Zen sort of guy. 
Um, and uh, and I, it's funny because I sort of talk to him and I ask him things, and he kind of doesn't say anything. And I'm like, yeah, I know what you mean. You know, it's it's like a weird sort of a thing with him. Um, I was really lucky to have a bunch of uh, friends at college. Also, I was in an acapella in the acapella world. I don't know. I I knew you thought I was cool before, but now let me tell you this. I was in acapella. So <laughs> um, uh, so there are a couple of real mentors in in, in that uh, world as well. Um, uh, music directors and people who turned me on like college, like the college dorm, right? That's why I heard everything like that. I mean, I didn't, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I liked, I, I knew nothing. I was from Long Island and that's it. You're a Long Islander. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you know, Long Island. Yep. You gotta so, get out. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a thing. <laughs> so I had to sort of get out and there were just a lot of mentors uh, out there um, that, that really helped. Um, college friends, Bob Power, guitar teachers, of course. Uh, one guitar teacher, Glenn Alexander, actually, who told me, <laughs> he's like, if you want to play guitar for the rest of your life, learn how to sing. I'm like, wow, I, I suck that bad. And, and he was like, no, it's just singing is, uh, singing is a whole other world, right? And, and your mouth is available while you're playing the guitar. So, um, and so I learned how to sing and i think within like six months i outstripped like 15 years of guitar <laughs> so, uh, so i have him to thank for for that you know folks like that you know books dostoevsky of course <laughs> these are all mentors oh we have one last great question from brian before we go Mike, we do in our songwriting group, we do a songwriting challenge every month and everybody, we give everybody one prompt to all write to. And the challenge this month is to write a, a funny song, which we've never done before. Mm. So any tips there? Um, funny songs are really, uh, uh, that's a particular thing, right? And I would say that funny songs, uh, need to adhere it's all about the end rhyme right the funny comes really from an end rhyme i would watch inside the book the uh, movie by um uh bo burnham uh and i would watch uh tiktok i would watch funny mm -hmm. tiktok things but um every line has to land and i think if it's a slant rhyme it doesn't work as well I, and i think if you listen to, uh, uh, pe yeah, people like Bo Burnham, um, the fact that the unfamiliar and unexpected rhyme lands perfectly is always funnier to me. Like that would be just one thing I would, I would do. I would pick a form also that gives you the maximum number of jokes, right? So maybe an AAA type of form where you only have to land at, on, a, um, on a refrain, but all the other things can be jokes. Um, that could actually work uh, pretty well. Um, yeah, and all these things can be just blown out of the water by just a kick-ass idea. You know, <laughs> if you have a kick-ass idea, forget it, just get out of the way. That's great advice, though. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Mike, for being here. That, that, Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having me. This was amazing. <laughs> Should we unmute? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now we're all feeding back. I know. <laughs> Beautiful.